Hi everyone, welcome to AS Engineering College YouTube channel and series of lectures on the course Discrete Mathematics. So, in this today's session, I will be explaining you about the predicative logic 1. In the previous two sessions, I explained about mathematical logic 1, which is nothing but proportional logic. Now, in this today's session, I will be explaining about predicative logic, predicative logic. This predicative logic is also called mathematical logic 2 or first order logic. This predicative logic is also called first order logic. It is also called quantificational logic. So, the mathematics logic 2 is nothing but predicative logic. This predicative logic is also called first order logic or quantificational logic. Now, I will see what is first order logic or predicative logic. Now, in this today's predicative logic session, I will be explaining about the following topics. The first one is open statements. Then, we will discuss about the quantifiers. There are two types of quantifiers universal quantifiers and the second one is existential quantifiers. These are the two different types of the quantifiers. Then we will be discussing about the arguments. Then we will be discussing about methods of proof and methods of disproof. These are all the topics which I will be explaining in today's live session. Now let us, let us get into the topics. The first one is open statement. So, now I will be explaining the definition of open statement. So, now let us consider some examples. The first one is x divides 4. This is one statement sentence x divides 4. Next x plus 2 is equal to 5 and x y is less than 2. So, what is statement? Any declarative sentence which can be said either true or false is called statement. That is, for any sentence, if we are able to assign the truth value, either true or false, then it is called statement. Now look at this, x divides 4 is one sentence. Is it statement? So no, this is not a statement, we can't decide it. The reason is, we don't know the value of x. If we know the value of x, then we can say whether this is statement or not. So, this in this, we need to have the x value. We need to have the x value. If we know the x value, then we will be deciding whether x is dividing 4 or not. Now, look at this sentence x plus y is equal, x plus 2 is equal to 5. Here also, if you know x value, then it is easy for us to say whether it is true or false. Otherwise, we can't decide. Now, if you look at this third example, x y is less than 2, x y is less than 2. If I give x value and less y value, then we can verify whether x y is less than 2 or greater than 2. If you observe all these sentences, these sentences become statements when we specify the variables involving in these sentences. For example, in this, the variable involved is x. In this, the variable involved is x. In this, the variables involved are x and y. If I know x and y values, then we will be able to say whether they are statements or they are not. These type of sentences are called open statements. These type of sentences are called open statements. So, the above sentences are not statement unless the symbol x and y are specified x and y are specified. If I specify x and y values, then we can assign the truth value for these examples. Now, this one, sentences of this kind are called open statements. Open statements are open sentences. These type of sentences are called open statements or open sentences. The next point, 
the unspecified symbols x and y are called free variables. There is a name for the variables involved in the open statements and that name is free variables. Free variable is nothing but the variables which are there in the open statements. In this first example, the free, free variable is x. In the second example, the free variable is x. In the third example, the free variables are x and y. Free variables are nothing but the variables which are there in the open statements or open sentences. Next, the above sentences become statements if x and y are specified with any element from R. Here R is nothing but the set of all real numbers. If we specify R, if you give any value for x and y from the real number system, then those becomes statements. Here R is called the universe of discourse. The universe of discourse or universe. Universe of discourse or universe. That means if you take these three examples, in these three examples, if you give any value to the x and y from the real number system R, then these three examples, these three sta open statements become statements. And here this R is called universe of discourse or universe. Now, the open, generally the open statements are gender, uh, denoted with like this. The open statements or open sentences are denoted with P of x, Q of x, and so on. Here x is the free variable. If there are two free variables, then the open statements are denoted like this. If there are two, way, two free variables, x and y, x comma y, or Q of x comma y. If there are two free variables, then those open statements are denoted with P of x comma y or Q of x comma y. In this x comma y are free variables. Then, it's clear that an open statement becomes statements only when the free variables are replaced with any chosen element from the universe. If you replace any, if you choose any element for any value for x and y from the real number system or if you substitute them in these examples, these examples will become statements. Now next. Now we'll see what is predicate. Now the part of the, this is the definition of the predicate, the part of the open statement, the part of the open statement P of x, which makes P of x as a statement when x is replaced with any chosen element from the universe is called predicate. Let, us ex let me explain this with some simple example. So this is the example. I am taking the example P of x is, x is an even integer. So this P of x is the open statement because x is not specified. You can't assign the truth value for this unless x is specified. If I specify x value, then it becomes statement. Now, as of now, this is an open statement. And this open statement is involving the pre-variable x. In this open statement, is an even number is the predicate. If you look at this open statement, is an this is the predicate. This is the predicate and x is the free variable. So here in the open statement is an even number is the predicate and the set of all real numbers R is the universe. Now what is the definition of predicate? The part of the open statement P of x which makes P of x as statement when x is replaced by any chosen element is called predicate. Next, the logics which we are discussing for predicates is called predicative logic. The logic involved in the analysis of predicates is called predicative logic. This is about the predicative logic. This predicative logic is also called first order logic or mathematical logic one or quantificational logic. Now, like compound statements, in, law, in previous sessions I explained about the compound statements which are obtained by the logical connectives. We had and connective, not connective, or connective, if then, and if and only if. By using those connectives, we will be combining the statements. If you combine them by using those state, uh, logical connectives, 
then we'll be getting the compound propositions. Those compound propositions are having some next limbs like negation, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, and biconditional. Similar to statements, here also in open statements, we have the compound statements for the open statements. So here if I take two open statements P of x, so here I am taking two open statements P of x and Q of x. P of x and Q of x are two open statements. So now for these two open statements, I am going to explain what are the compound statements we obtain for this P of x and Q of x by using the logical connective. If you apply the not connective, if you apply not connective, then we will be getting the negation. Then we will be getting the negation. So the negation of any statement, any open statement P of x is denoted with negation of P of x. This is the symbol which we denote for negation. The next one is disjunctive statement. This disjunctive statement is obtained by combining P of x and Q of x with the help of R connective. So this is obtained with the help of R connective. So then this is called disjunction. The next one is exclusive disjunction. As I told you, the R can be taken in two senses. One is the inclusive sense, which is nothing but only R, and the other one is exclusive R. So by using exclusive R, you will be getting exclusive disjunction. So when we combine P of x and Q of x, by using the connective exclusive R, then you will be getting the exclusive disjunction and this is the exclusive disjunction. It, it can be read as either P of x or Q of x, but not both. The next compound statement is conjunction. So the conjunction is obtained by combining two open statements P of x and Q of x with the help of AND connective. With the help of AND connective. So then we'll be getting a compound statement called conjunction. This is the conjunction P of x and Q of x. This is a symbol which we use for conjunction. The next one is conditional. So by using if then connective, then you will be getting the conditional statement. If you use if then connective, then you will be getting the conditional statement. This, this is read as P of x conditional Q of x. The next one is biconditional. So by using the logical connective, if and only if, we are going to get the compound statement called biconditional and this is P of x biconditional Q of x. We, all know, we already know that this biconditional is a conjunction of two conditional statements. Next, these are all the compound statements which we can get by using the logical connective. So by using not connective, you will be getting negation. By using R connective, we will be getting disjunction. By using exclusive R, we will be getting exclusive disjunction. By using AND connective, you will be getting conjunction. By using IF THEN connective, we will be getting the conditional. Next, by using IF AND ONLY IF connective, we will be getting biconditional statement. Now, these are all the examples for, now let us see some examples. Here I am taking some open statements, P of X, Q of X, and R of X. So the P of X is X is greater than 3, Q of X is X plus 1 is even integer, and R of X is X is less than or equal to 0. Now I am going to find out the truth values of these statements. The first one is P of 2. So this is the P of X. When we replace X with 2, then you will be getting P of 2. P of 2 is nothing but 2 is greater than 3. When we replace x with 2, then you will be getting 2 is greater than 3. Is 2 is greater than 3? No, 2 is not greater than 3. 2 is less than 3. Therefore, the truth value of this is false. So, the P of 2 is false. Then, P of 3 or Q of 2. P of 3 or Q of 2. So, this is the disjunction of P of 3 and Q of 2. So what is P of 3? P of 3 is, this is P of x, 3 plus 1 is even integer. What is 3 plus 1? 3 plus 1, 1 is 4. 4 is even integer. So is it true or false? Yes, the truth value of P of 3 is true. 
Now this is what is the truth value of Q of 2. Q of 2. Sorry, this P of 3 is x is greater than So P of 3 is this. This is P of x, right? So here P of 3. P of 3 is nothing but 3 is greater than 3. Is 3 is greater than 3? No. 3 is not greater than 3. 3 is equal to 3. So the truth value of this is false. Next one is Q of 2. So this is Q of x. x plus 1 is even. When we replace x with 2, then you will be getting 2 plus 1. 2 plus 1 is nothing but 3. 3 is even. So this is P of 2. Is it true or false? 3 is not an even number. 3 is an odd number. So the truth value of this is false. Now come to this one. Here P of 3 is false. Q of 2 is false. So the design to statement is false when both of them are false, which is nothing but when P of 3 is false and Q of 3 is false, if we design to them, then its truth value is false. So the second one, truth value is false. The second one, truth value is false. Now look at the third one. Negation P, P of 3. So P of 3 is 3 is greater than 3. So we have to find the negation of it. So the negation of P of 3 is denoted as negation P of 3, which is nothing but 3 is less than 3. 3 is less than 3. So is it true? So this is false. This is false. So what is the negation of 3? Negation of 3 is also false. P of 3 is 3 is greater than 3 is false. Negation of 3 is greater than 3 is nothing but 3 is less than or equal to 3. 3 is less than or equal to 3. 3 is less than or equal to 3 means yes, it is true. Because 3 is equal to 3 is equal to 3. So the truth value of this one is true. So here P of 3 is false. It's a negation. 3 is less than or equal to. When we consider the equality, 3 is equal to 3. Therefore, that statement is true. So the truth value of this one is true. Now I'll say the next example. P of 1 or Q of 2. So here P of 1 means 1 is greater than 3. 1 is, x is greater than 3. When we replace x with 1, we'll be getting 1 is greater than 3. Is it true or false? This is false. Similarly, Q of 2. So Q of 2 means 2 plus 1. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 is even integer. Is 3 is even integer? No. 3 is even integer is wrong. That means 3 is odd integer. So the truth value of this is false. So P of 1 is false. Q of 2 is also false. Therefore, the truth value of this one is false. The truth value of this one is false. Similarly, the next one, P of P of 3, this is the exclusive distinction. Either P of 3 or Q of 5, but not both. The exclusive distinction is true if either of them are true. If either of them are true, then the exclusive distinction is true. So P of 3, what is P of 3? 3 is greater than 3. This is false. The exclusive distinction. Q of 5. So this is Q of x. 5 plus 1. 5 plus 1, 6. 6 is even integer. Yes, true. So this is true. So if either of them are true, then the exclusive disjunctive statement is true. So the exclusive disjunction of P of 3 and Q of 5 is true. So next one is P of 2 conditional Q of 3. So this is the conditional statement. This conditional statement, P conditional Q is false when P is true and Q is false. In this case only the conditional statement is false. So this is a conditional statement. 
this conditional statement is false when p of 2 is true and q of 3 is false. We will verify whether p of 2 is true or not. So, the truth value of p of 2, 2 is greater than 3. 2 is greater than 3 means it is false. So, the truth value of q of 3, 3 plus 1, <coughs> 4 is even integer. This is true. So, the LHS part is false and the RHS part is true. Therefore, the truth value of this one is true. Because the conditional statement P conditional Q is false only when P is true and Q is false. In all other cases, this conditional statement is true. So, these are all the truth values of the given. These are the truth values of the compound statements for the given open statements P of X, Q of X and R of X. Next. <coughs> Now, I'll say the quantifiers. So, I already explained about the open statements. Now, we'll be discussing about the quantifiers. So, now, before I am going to give you the definition of quantifiers, let me give you some examples. The first one is, all squares are rectangles. All squares are rectangles. The second one is, for every integer x, x square is non-negative integer. Next, some determinants are equal to 0. And the next one is, there exists a real number whose square is itself. These are all the four different examples. If you look at them, the first one is, all squares are rectangles. All squares are rectangles. Look at the second example. For every integer x, for every integer x, x square is non-negative integer. Next, some determinants are equal to zeros. Next, there exists a real number whose square is itself. So, if you observe these four examples, if you observe these four statements, these four statements are speaking about the idea of the quantity of the statement, the idea of the quantity of the statement. Therefore, this type of statements are called quantified statements. This type of statements are called quantified statements. So, in the above sentence, statements, the words all, for every, some, and their exist are associated with the idea of the quantity. Such words are called quantifiers. Such words are called quantifiers. So, quantifiers are nothing but for all, for every, for some, there exist. These are all called quantifiers because they are describing the quantity of the statements. So, therefore, they are called quantifiers. Now, the above statements are describing the quantity of the statements. Hence, these, ca these are called quantified statements. These are called quantified statements. Now, we will see the symbolic forms of all these quantified statements. So, the first one is, this is the symbolic form of, remember, in every quantified statement, there will be the universe, there will be the universe, and there will be the open statement, and there will be the quantifier, there will be the quantifier. So, here the symbolic form of the first one is, now before I am going to write the symbolic form of these examples, let me explain about the different kinds of quantifiers. So, there are two types of quantifiers. After giving you the definitions of types of the quantifiers, I will be explaining the symbolic forms of the examples which I have shown to you. Now, types of the quantifiers. So, there are two types of quantifiers. The first one is universal quantifiers. So, universal quantifiers means the words for all, for every, for any, for each are called universal quantifiers. So, whatever words I am displaying here, these are all logically equivalent. They have same meaning. For all, for every, for any, and for each. These are called, these words are called universal quantifiers. And these universal quantifiers are denoted with the symbol for all. This is the symbol which we use to denote the universal quantifiers. Next, we have existential quantifiers. So, the words for some, there exist, 
for at least one for at least one these are called existential quantifiers so these words for for some there exist and for at least one are logically equivalent to them each other these are called existential quantifiers and the existential quantifiers are denoted with this symbol this is there exist so this is the symbol which we use to denote the universal quantifiers and this is the symbol which we are using to denote the existential quantifiers so the quantifiers are two types universal quantifiers and existential quantifiers now what is quantified statement means any compound proposition which is involving either universal quantifiers or existential quantifiers any statement any statement any quantified statement or any compound statement which is involving either universal quantifiers or existential quantifiers then it is called quantified statement so now here in the quantified statement the invariables which are present in the quantified statements are called bound variables so we already seen free variables so if you take the open statement in every open statement there will be some variables those variables are called free variables likewise in the quantified statements also there will be the open variables those variables are called bound variables so now this is about the quantifiers universal quantifiers existential quantifiers universal quantifiers means for all for every for each and for any these are universal quantifiers for some there exist for at least one or existential quantifiers and the quantified statement is if the compound statement which is involving either universal quantifier or existential quantifier is called quantified statement for example if the given statement is involving only universal quantifier then that is called universal quantified statement if the given statement is involving only existential quantifier then that is called existential quantified statement now we'll see the symbolic forms of the examples which i have taken just now so these are all the examples now we'll see the symbolic forms of these quantified statements so in every quantified statement there will be open statement there will be universe and there will be the quantifier it may be universal quantifier or existential quantifier if you look at the first example here the set of all squares is the universal quantifier if you observe it all the squares are rectangles which are rectangles squares are rectangles so the set of all squares is the universe and the open statement is x is a rectangle x is re a rectangle so now this is symbolic form for all x belongs to s p of x for all x belongs to s p of x so this for all is the universal quantifier that universal quantifier is denoted with for all x belongs to s s is the set of all squares so then me meaning of this is that every x is a rectangle every x is a rectangle what is x actually x is u, u square x is u square that means the universe is consisting of all squares if you take any element in the universe then that element is a rectangle this is the symbolic form of this one now look at the second one for every this is also universal quantifier for every is also universal quantifier therefore that is the universal quantified statement for every integer x x is non negative integer for every integer for every integer means the universe of this second example is set of all integers is the universe and so in the second example there is the universal quantifier and there is the universe that universe is set of all integers and the open statement is q of x q of x is x square is non negative integers x square is non negative integer so non negative integer means x square is greater than or equal to 0 x square is greater than or equal to 0 so x square is non negative is nothing but x square is greater than or equal to 0 so in the example we have a universal quantifier and we have a universe that is set of all real numbers and we have the quantifier sorry open statement 
that open statement is q of x, which is nothing but x square is non-negative integer. Now, if you look at this third one, so the third example, for some, for some means that is the existential quantifier. Therefore, this statement is called existential quantified statement. So, some determinants are equal to zero. Which are equal to zero? Some determinants. Some is the existential quantifier and determinants are equal to zero. That means, in the second example, we have an existential quantifier and we have the universe. That universe is set of all determinants. The set of all determinants which is denoted with D is the universe. D is the universe. What is D? Set of all indices. And this is the open state, this is the existential quantifier for all x belongs to D, R of x. What is R of x? x is equal to 0. What x is equal to 0? What is x? x is a one element in the universe. x is one element in the set D. D is consisting of all the determinants. So, x is equal to 0 is nothing but determinant is equal to 0. How many determinants are equal to 0? Only some. Some determinants are equal to 0. That is a symbolic form of third one. And the fourth one is there exist. There exist is the existential quantified statement. There exists a real number whose square is equal to itself. There exists a real number whose square is itself. That means in this fourth example, there exists is the existential quantifier and the set of all real numbers is the universe. The set of all real numbers is the universe and this is the existential quantifier. For, for some x belongs to R, S of x. What is S of x? X is real number whose square is equal to itself. X is real number whose square is equal to itself. So this can also be written x square is equal to x. x square is equal to x. x square is equal to x is nothing but the square of x is itself. The square of x is itself. So here in fourth example, there is a existential quantifier and there is a universe that is set of all real numbers is the universe and the open statement is x is a real number. So these are all the <coughs> symbolic forms of the given quantified statements. So now we'll discuss about the, what are the truth values of the quantified statement. So like statement, every quantified statement will be having the truth value, either true or false. We'll see what are the, all the truth values of the quantified statements. The first one, this is a statement. So what is the statement? The statement for x belongs to yes p of x is true only when p of x is true for every x belongs to s. So this is the quantified statement, universal quantified statement. This universal quantified statement is true only when p of x is true for all x belongs to s. So here there is a universal quantity for all x belongs to s p of x. So when p of x is true, when p of x is true for all x belongs to s, then we will be considering this quantified statement as a true. So this is the universal quantified statement. This universal quantified statement is true when p of x is true for every element in the universe, yes. And the next one is the statement for all x belongs to x, p of x is false only when p of x is false for some x belongs to s. So if you want to prove that, this universal st quantified statement is false, just take at least one element and prove that this statement is false. So one element means take one value from the universe, yes. For that value, if p of x is false, then the total quantified statement is false. So this is, this quantified statement is true when p of x is true for every value of x. This quantified statement is false when p of x is false for at least one value. Similarly, we will take, look at this. This is one existential quantifier statement for some x belongs to s p of x. So if you want to prove that for some x belongs to x p of x is false, then you have to prove that p of x is false for every x value from the universe s. Yes. Similarly, if you want to prove this 
quantified statement, existential quantified statement is true, then you can take at least one value. For some x belongs to s, p of x. So p of x is true for how many values? For some values. That means to prove this, take some value. That sum can be either one or two or more. So to prove this for some x belongs to s, p of x is true, you have to prove that p of x is true for at least one value. So if you want to prove that this statement is false, then you have to prove for every x value that statement, open statement p of x is false. So these are the truth values of universal quantified statement. So now we have some rules of inferences. So under these rules of inferences, we have some two rules, rules of inferences. These two rules of inferences are very important one. The first one is the rule of universal specification. So the rule of universal specification says that if a open statement P of X is known to be true for all X in the universe, yes. And if A belongs to yes, then P of A is true. Let me explain this with diag one diagram. So this is the universe. I am taking some universe. So this is the universe. So that universe is denoted with yes. That universe is denoted with yes. So in this there are so many elements. This P of X is true for all X belongs to yes. P of X is true for any element in the universe. If you take some element in the universe, then P of A must be true. P of A must be true. So the meaning of this is that if P of X is true for every value in the universe, then P of X must be true for any value in this universe, for any value in this universe. So this, the rule of universal specification can also be said for all X belongs to yes, P of X implies P of A. So here, this is the symbol which we call logical implication. So what is logical implication? Whenever LHS is true, RHS must be true. So what is the LHS? If P of X is true for every element in the universe, then P of A must be true because the element A is belongs to that universe. This is the rule of universal specification. The second one is the rule of universal generalization. So the rule of universal generalization says that if an open statement P of X is proved to be true for any arbitrary value X chosen from the universe, then the quantified statement for all X belongs to X, P of X is also true. That means if you prove that the P of X is true for some arbitrary values, if P of X is true for some arbitrary values, then it must be true for all value in the universe, yes. This is called universal generalization and this is called universal specification. Now let's see what are logical. Like the logical equivalence for statements, we have logical equivalence for quantified statements also. If two quantified statements are having same truth value, then we say that both of them are logically equivalent to each other. So now this is one quantified statement for all x, p of x and q of x. For all x, p of x and q of x. So this is logically equivalent to for all x, p of x and for all x, q of x. If p of x and q of x is true for all values of x, then this p of x must be true for all values of x and q of x must be true for all values of x. The reason is, the con this is the dis conjunctive statement, p of x and q of x. So this is the conjunctive statement which is obtained by using the logical connective and. This conjunctive statement is true when both p of x and q of x are true. So if this conjunctive statement is true for all x, then it must be true for p of x and for q of x also. So that is the first inequality. The next one is, for some x, p of x or q of x. For some x, p of x or q of x. So this is the <coughs> disjunction of, sorry, disjunction of p of x and q of x. So the disjunctive statement is false 
when both of them are false. So, for some x, p of x or q of x is logically equivalent to for some x, p of x and for some x or for some x, q of x. That is the second inequality. The next one, for all x, p of x conditional q of x is logically equivalent to for some x, negation p of x conditional, negation p of x conditional q of x. That means this is logically equivalent to for all x. So this is the conditional statement. If you remove the conditional, then you will be getting negation p of x or q of x. So this is the formula when we replace, when we remove conditional statement, then you will be getting negation p of x or q of x. That we have seen in the video lecture 1. When I was explaining about the conditional statement, I have proved how p of x conditional is, p of x conditional q of x is logically equivalent to negation p of x or q of x. So if this disjunctive statement is false for all values of x, it must be false for some values of x also. This is negation p of x or q of x. So if any disjunctive statement is true for all values of x, obviously that must be true for some values of x. So these are all the inequalities. These are all the inequalities related to the logical equivalence. Now we'll see the negation, negation of the quantified statement. So if you want to find out the negation of the statements, which we have discussed in the video lecture one, you have to replace and connective with R connective, tautology with F naught, then you will be getting the negation of the any compound statement. So the negation of the compound statement is obtained by replacing and connective with R connective vice versa, by tautology with contradiction and vice versa. If you take the quantified statements, then how to find out the negation of the quantified statement. So the negation of the quantified statement is obtained by using these three conditions. Condition number one, universal quantifier will be replaced with existential quantifier. So if there is a universal quantifier, then that will be replaced with the existential quantifier. This is the universal quantifier, that will be replaced with the existential quantifier. So that is the condition one and vice versa. If there is universal quantifier, replace that with existential quantifier. If there is an existential quantifier, then replace that with universal quantifier. That is the condition number one. The condition number two is and connective with R connective and vice versa. If there is an and connective, replace that and connective with R connective and vice versa. The next one. <coughs> open statement with its negation. When we are finding the negation of any quantified statement, we have to replace the open statement with its negation. So by using these three conditions, we can find the negation of any quantified statement. Condition number one, replace universal quantifier with existential quantifier and vice versa. Condition number two, and connective with R connective and vice versa. Condition number three, open statement with its negation. Now we'll see some examples. So this is the open statement. Sorry, this is the quantified statement. Now the negation of it. So this is the quantified statement. We are going to find the negation of it. So the first point, if there is a universal quantifier, replace with existential quantifier. If there is existential quantifier, then replace that with universal quantifiers. So here there is an existential quantifier. I am replacing that with universal quantifier. This is first, first condition number one. So here there is existential quantifier that is replaced with universal quantifier. Now condition number three, two. What is condition number two? If there is an and connective, here there is an and connective, I am replacing that with R connective. If there is an and connective, replace that with R connective. Condition number two. So condition number three, if there are open statements, we have to replace those open statements with its negations. Here P of X and Q of X are there. We have to replace them with their negations. Their negations means 
negation p of x and negation q of x. So here we are going to find out the negation of this by replacing existential quantifiers with universal quantifier and by replacing and connective with or connective and by replacing open statements with their negations open statements with their negation. This is how we have to find the negation of the given quantified statements. Now let us see one more example. So the second example is this. For some, this is the existential quantifier. If the existential quantifier can be denoted, so the universal quantifier can be denoted either for all x belongs to s or like this. The existing universal quantifier will be represented either like this or like this. So this is the ex universal quantifier. The universal quantifier is denoted like this or like this. So negation for all x, p of x or q of x. So here there is a universal quantifier that is replaced with existential quantifier. R connective is there that is replaced with and connective and open statements are there. I am re, you know, uh, replacing those open statements with their negations. Though, so the LHS is logically equal to that one. This is, the neg this is the quantified statement. If you take the negation of it, then you will be getting the equivalent compound statement. So this is how we have to find out the negation of the quantified statement. Now I'll see some some of the quantified statements and we will write the symbolic forms of them. The first one, some integers are divisible by phi. Some integers are divisible by phi. So here what is the universe? Some integers, z, I am denoting z. Z is nothing but set of all integers. Set of all integers. So set of all integers is the universe. This is the universe. So the set of all integers is denoted with z. So for this statement, z is the universe. So as I told you, every quantified statement is will be having one quantifier that will be universal or existential quantifier, and there will be open statement and there will be uh, what universe. So I have identified the universe. So now what is this one for some? This is the existential quantified statement. For some x belongs to z. For some x belongs to z. P of x. What is P of x? So the P of x is x is divisible by phi. x is divisible by phi x is divisible by phi. So now look at, this is the symbolic form of this. So there is a existential quantifier that is denoted with for some for there exist. There exist x belongs to z p of x. What is p of x? x is divisible by phi. What is x? Any element in the set of all indices. Now this is the second example. There exists a matrix whose transpose is itself. There exists a matrix whose transpose is itself. So here, the universe is set of all matrices. Set of all matrices. So I am denoting set of all matrices as M, and this will be the universe. In the second example, M is the universe. What is M? Set of all matrices. So here, there is a existential quantifier. There exists. So this is denoted with for some x belongs to m comma q of x. So what is q of x? q of x is x transpose is equal to x. x transpose equal to x. So the open statement is whose transpose is equal to itself. Whose transpose is equal to itself. So if you take any element x, in the matrices, then the transpose of that x is equal to itself. So this is the symbolic form of the second one. Look at the third one. Here there is universal quantifier. All, 
all real numbers. So, R is the universe. Here in the second, third example, the set of all real numbers is the universe. And there is a universal quantifier. This universal quantifier is denoted like this. For all, x belongs to R, R of x. So, what is R of x? So, R of x is the open statement. So, what is the open statement in this R of x? x is complex number. All real numbers are complex. That is, x is complex number. x is complex number. So, what is x here? Real number. So, how many real numbers are complex numbers? All real numbers. So, for all x belongs to R, R of x is nothing but all real numbers are complex numbers. So, now then next example is there is an integer. There is an integer. That means existential quantifier. For some x belongs to z. So, the set of all integers is the universe. Z is the universe. For some x belongs to z which is not a perfect square, which is not a perfect square. So, that means, what is this? T of x. So, the T of x, what is T of x? Open statement. x is not a perfect square. x is not a perfect square. So, that is the open statement. And one more example. No real number is greater than its square. No real number is greater than its square. No real number is greater than its square is nothing but all real numbers are not greater than its square. So I repeat, no real number is greater than its square is nothing but all real numbers are not greater than their square. So here, there is a universal quantifier for all x belongs to R. So, what is the universe here? Real numbers. The set of all real numbers is the universe. For all x belongs to R, x is not greater than its square. So, this is some S of x. So, what is S of x? x squared. For no real number is greater than its square. That is, x is x is not greater than not greater than its square. Not greater than its square. This is the symbolic form of this. So, no real number is greater than its square is nothing but all real numbers are not greater than its square. So, here set of all real numbers is the universe and there is a universal quantifier and the open statement is x is not greater than its square. Now we'll see, we'll take some quantified statements and we'll find the negation of it. So the first one, so this is one quantified statement. Now we'll write the negation of this. So as I told you, the negation of the quantified statement is obtained by replacing universal with existential and existential with universal vice versa and connective with R connective and R connective with and connective and vice versa and open statements with its negations. So, here all is there. All means universal quantifier, replace that with existential quantifier. For some, that is, for some is nothing but Some even integers, some even numbers, some even numbers, or you have to take the negation of it, or not multiple of four. So the negation of this is. Some even integers are not multiple of 4. I have replaced universal quantifier with 
existential quantifier and there is no connective in this. So, this is the open statement I have taken the negation of that open statement. The negation of the open statement is not multiple of even numbers are not multiple of 4. So, now look at this. No real number is greater than its square. So, no real number is greater than its square means all real numbers are not greater than its square. The negation of this is some real numbers, some real numbers are greater than are greater than their squares. Their squares. That is the negation of this. The next quantified statement is there is some integer k for which 12 is equal to 3k. The negation there, there is some indices that is universal existential quantifier. So, where you have to replace existential quantifier with universal quantifier. That is for all integers, for all integers k, you have to take the negation of this. 12 is not equal to 3k. 12 is not equal to 3k. So, I have replaced existential quantifier with universal quantifier and this is the open statement I have taken the negation of it. Next, there exists an odd integer whose product is odd. So, this is existential quantifier. Replace that with universal quantifiers. All odd integers all odd integers, for all odd integers, for all odd integers, the product of odd integers, the product, the product of odd integers, the product of odd integers, we have to take the negation of it, right? So, the product of odd integers is odd. When you take the negation of it, the product of odd integers is even. So, this is the symbolic, this is the negation of this existential quantifier. So, this is how we write the negation of the given quantified statement. That may be universal quantified statement or existential quantified statement or only quantified statement. So, now you see this one. So, in the logical implication involving quantifiers. So, we have discussed this logical implication in the statements also. Again, we will be discussing this logical implication for quantified statements. So, what is the definition of this? A quantified statement P. P is some quantified statement that may be universal quantified statement or existential quantified statement. This quantified statement is said to be logically imply a quantified statement Q, if Q is true whenever P is true, then we say right, P is logically imply Q, P is logically imply Q. So, P is logically imply Q means Q must be true whenever P is true. So, this is Q must be true, Q must be true whenever whenever P is true, whenever P is true. So, if Q is true, whenever P is true, then we say that P is logically imply Q, P is logically imply Q. So, this is the symbol which we use for logical implication. That is the symbol which we use for logical implication. Similarly, this we can define the argument for quantified statements. So, what is the argument of quantified statement? Here, some, I am taking some quantified statements. P1, P2 and so on, Pn are all quantified statements and Q is a conclusion. Q is a conclusion. So, then P of P1 and P2 and, and so on and Pn, conditional Q is valid if the conjunction of this P1 and P2 and, and so on, Pn 
is logically imply Q. So, here, here this is the argument P1, P2 and so on, Pn, therefore Q. So, this is the argument. So, in this argument P1, P2 and so on, Pn are all the premises. These are called premises. P1, P2 and so on, Pn are called premises. And Q is the conclusion. Q is the conclusion. So, this is the argument. When it becomes valid argument, if you take the conjunction of the premises, from the conjunction of the premises, if you are able to derive the conclusion, then it is called valid argument. So, take the conjunction of the premises. From that conjunction of the premises, if you are able to derive the conclusion, then it is valid argument. Otherwise, it is invalid argument. So, by taking the conjunction of the premises, deriving the argument is nothing but you have to prove that the conjunction of the premises is logically imply Q. So, this is the logical implication. This is the logical implication. Whenever the conjunction of the premises is logically imply Q, we say that Q is the valid argument which is derived from the conjunction of the premises P1, P2 and so on Pn. So, this is how we have to prove whether the given argument is valid or not. So, you will be given some argument which will be consisting of some premises. Take the conjunction of the premises. If the conjunction of the premises is true, in that case Q is also true, then the LHS is logically imply RHS which is nothing but the given argument is valid. Otherwise, it is invalid. Now, you see some problems based on these arguments. So, test whether the following arguments are valid or not. I am taking some arguments. So, what is the argument? There will be premises and there will be the conclusion. So, now I will see the premises. All men are mortal. That is one premises. The second one, Anil is a man. Uh, next, the conclusion is, therefore, Anil is a mortal. Anil is a mortal. So, that is the argument. All men are mortal. Anil is a man. Therefore, Anil is mortal. If you observe this argument, you can come to the conclusion that this is the valid argument. Because if all men are mortal, Anil is also men. Obviously, Anil must be mortal. So, that is the argument. Now, we have to prove this argument as valid argument with the help of rules of inferences. As I told you some rules of inferences, by using those rules of inferences, we are going to test whether this is a valid or argument or not. So, before you are going to prove it, take the symbolic form of it. So, the symbolic form of it is, let S denotes the set of all men. So, that is the universe. This is the universal quantified, right? This is the universal quantified statement. In that universal quantified statement, there will be the universal quantifier and there is the universe and there is the open statement. This is the universe. Universe is set of all men. So, P of x. What is P of x? x is mortal is the open statement. Now, the symbol anil is one element in the universe. So, if you take symbolic form of this, for all x belongs to S P of x. For all x belongs to S P of x. So, what is P of x? x is a mortal. What is x? One element in the universe. What type of elements are there in the universe? Men. The set universe will be consisting of set of all men. So, the meaning of this is that the set of all men is mortal. Next, what is next? A belongs to S. Anil is mortal. So, this is P of x. What is P of x? x is mortal. If I take x is equal to A, what is A? Anil. Anil is some element. A belongs to S. This is, therefore, this is P of A. So, if you observe this, we must recollect one of the formulas. That is the rule of universal specification. So, the rule of universal specification says that, the rule of universal specification is this. If an open statement P of X is known to be true for all values of X and A is one element in the universe, then P of A is also true. Which means, 
for all x belongs to s comma p of x if for all x belongs to s p of x is true and a belongs to s then p of a must be true p of a must be true so so this symbolic for whatever symbolic form whatever argument they have given that is the statement of the rule of universal specification so for all x belongs to s p of x and a belongs to s therefore p of a is true so what is p of a here p of a is the conclusion what is conclusion anil is mortal if you substitute x is equal to anil anil is mortal so from these premises you will be able to derive the conclusion you will be able to derive the conclusion with the help of the rule of universal specification therefore the given argument is valid the given argument is valid so how it is valid if all men are mortal anil is man then anil must be mortal with the help of the rule of universal specification now i'll see one more example now look at this there are there, there are some premises so there are two premises premises number 1 this is the premises number 1 and this is the premises number 2 that is the premises number 2 so the premises number 1 is no graduate student no graduate student of commerce or literature studies physics no graduate student student of commerce or literature studies physics anil is a graduate stud student who studies physics therefore anil is not a graduate student of literature that is the argument now if you apply observe the first premise is no graduate student of commerce or literature studies physics means all graduate students of commerce or literature studies physics so the first premise is, is nothing but all the graduate student of commerce or literature studies physics so if you take the symbolic form of it here the universe the universe is the set of all graduate student the set of all graduate student there are some open statement p of x x studies commerce next q of x x studies literature r of x x studies physics so some graduate student are studying commerce that is p of x some graduate students are studying literature some graduate students are studying physics so there are three open statement p of x q of x and r of x now if you take the symbolic form of this no graduate student is nothing but all graduate student for all x belongs to s if you observe this this is the disjunctive statement so if a graduate student of commerce or literature if x is a graduate student of commerce or literature then he is going to study physics who is going to study physics only the students of commerce or literature that is the conditional statement if x is a student of literature or commerce then only he is going to study the physics so for all x belongs to s p of x or q of x conditional negation or of x so no graduate student means all graduate student of commerce or literature are not going to study physics the next one the next premise is, is anil is a graduate student who studies physics this is r of x r of x says x studies phys physics in place of x i am taking one element that is anil anil studies physics is r of e now therefore the conclusion is anil is not a graduate student of literature so q of p of x r of x x studies literature yes x studies literature no graduate student of literature anil is not a graduate student so you have to take the negation of q of x and substitute x is equal to anil then you will be getting q of e negation q of e so this is one premises and this is the other premises and the conclusion is negation of q of e now with the help of laws of logics and truth values of the quantified statement you have to verify whether this statement is this argument is valid or not so i am taking the conjunction of the premises 
So this is one premises. This is one premises, and this is the other premises. I have taken the conjunction of these premises. Now, from the rule of universal specification, for all x belongs to S, P of x implies P of A. Here, A belongs to S. For all x belongs to S, P of x, and A belongs to S, then this is imply P of A. So, this statement P of x or Q of x conditional negation R of x is true for all x belongs to S and A is one element, therefore that must be, statement must be true, which means P of A or Q of A conditional negation R of A, this R of A will be as it is. Next I am removing the conditional. If you remove the conditional, it, don't remove the conditional, keep it in the conditional as it is and apply the conjunction or conjective simplification. So the conjective simplification says that P and Q is logically imply either P or Q. P and Q is logically imply either P or Q. So this total is P and R of A is Q. P and Q is logically imply any one of them. So now this is the logically imply negation R of A. So negation R of A means this negation R of A. This negation R of A can be written like this. So from the modus tollens, from the rule of modus tollens, this can be written R of A conditional negation P of A or Q of A and R of A. This is equal to negation P of A or Q of A. From this negation, I am removing the negation, I am applying the negation. So negation of P of A, R connective will be replaced with under connective and negation of Q of A. When we are finding the negation of any statement, you have to replace R connective with and connective and open statement with its negation. So negation P of A, R connective is replaced with and connective and negation Q of A. So that is the de Morgan's law. From this, the argument is valid. So this is the conjective statement. This conjective statement is logically imply either P of A or logically imply either negation Q of A. But here they have given the conclusion negation Q of A. So this is logically imply either negation P of A or negation Q of A. The given conclusion is negation Q of A. Therefore, it is valid argument. So this will be a valid argument if negation P of A is also given. If negation P of A is also given. So this is the argument. This argument is proved as valid argument with the help of the conjective simplification, modus phones, de Morgan's law. With the help of three laws. What are those three laws? Conjective simplification, modus phones, and de Morgan's law. We have proved that the given argument is valid. So now look at this example. They have given a symbolic form. So this is premises 1, this is premises 2, and this is the conclusion. Now I will take the conjunction of the premises. This is premises 1. I am conjecting this with premises 2. So this is the conjective symbol. So this, this implies, this implies, this is one universal quantified statement. This is the universal quantified statement. Here I am applying the rule of universal specification. From the rule of universal specification, for all x p of x q of x, conditional q of x is true, that must be true for some x is equal to a. That is p of a conditional q of a. From this q of a conditional p of a. So if you the rule of universal syllogism, from the rule of universal syllogism, that is P of A conditional Q of A and Q of A conditional R of A, then this is logically imply P of A conditional R of A. So if we remove this, this P of A conditional R of A. Now I am applying the rule of universal generalization. From the rule of generalization, if it is true for some arbitrary value, then it must be true for all values of X. Then it must be true for all values of X. So that is the argument. That is the argument. These two other premises, this is the conclusion. I have taken the conjunction of the premises. Then 
I applied the universal specification, then you will be getting negation P of A conditional, R of A. For this, I am applying the rule of universal generalization. Then you will be getting for all x, P of x conditional, R of x. With this, we prove that the given argument is valid. This is how we have to prove that the given arguments are valid or not. So valid argument means take the conjunction of the premises. From the conjunction of the premises, if you are able to derive the conclusion, then it is the valid argument. Otherwise, it is called invalid argument. So now this is all about arguments and valid arguments. Now we'll move to the next topic. The next topic is methods of proof and methods of disproof. Now first we'll see the methods of proof. So methods of proof is nothing but you will be given the conditional statement. You will be given some conditional statement P of P conditional Q. So you have to prove that this conditional statement is true. You have to prove that this conditional statement is true. So the process of proving this conditional statement is true is called method of proof. Method of proof is nothing but the process of proving the given conditional statement is true is called method of proof. So and the process of proving P conditional Q is false. The process of proving P conditional Q is false is called method of disproof. Method of proof is nothing but, nothing but proving the conditional statement is true. Method of disproof is nothing but proving the conditional statement is false. So to prove the given conditional statement is true and false, we have different methods. Now we will see those different methods one by one. First we discuss about the methods of proof. So to prove the conditional statement, we have three methods. The first one is direct proof. The first one is direct proof. So this is the first method to prove the given conditional statement is true. The second one is indirect proof. The third one is proof by contradiction. There are three methods to prove the given conditional statement is true. The first one is direct proof. Second one is indirect proof. And the th third one is proof by contradiction. These three methods will be involving three steps. Step number one, hypothesis. The step number one, hypothesis. In the hypothesis, this is the, we have to prove P conditional Q is true. We have to prove P conditional Q is true. P conditional Q is true means P is true, Q is true. P is true, Q is true. I am talking about the conditional statement with this hypothetical statement. So here P conditional Q is a hypothetical statement. Hypothetical statement means a conditional statement in which the truth value of P is depending on Q and the truth value of Q is depending on P. So this is the conditional statement and this conditional statement is a hypothetical statement. If P is true, Q is true, then it is true. This is one case. The second case is P conditional Q is false when P is true and Q is false. So for hypothetical statement, the hypothetical statement P conditional Q is true when both of them are true and is false when P is true and Q is false. So when we are proving the given conditional statement is true by using direct method, in the hypothesis, we are taking that, first assuming that, P is true. Next, the second, second step is analysis. In the analysis, we prove that Q is also true. First, we are assuming that P is true. Then we are proving that Q is also true. If both of them are true, then the conditional must be true. That will be concluded in the conclusion section. In the conclusion section, we are concluding that as P is true and Q is true, therefore, P conditional Q is also true. P conditional Q is also true. This is the direct method. We have hypothesis, first step. In hypothesis, we assume P is true. Second one is analysis. With the help of laws of logics, 
and the, all the formulas which we have discussed in the previous sessions. With the help of them, we are going to prove that Q is also true. When P is true and Q is true, the conditional statement is true. Now, I'll see, so we'll take some example and prove it. So, give the direct proof of the statement, the square of an odd integer is an odd integer. So, this statement can also be written like this. If n is an odd integer, then n square is also odd integer. If n is odd integer, then n square is also odd integer. So, the given statement can also be written like this. If n is odd integer, then n square is also odd integer. Now, we will take the symbolic form of this. This symbolic form of this is P conditional Q. What is P? n is odd integer. What is Q? n square is odd integer. Now, we will prove it with the help of direct, direct proof. The direct proof will be having three steps. The first one is hypothesis. In the hypothesis, what we have to do? We have to assume that P is true. What is P? n is odd integer. So, n is odd integer. How to say that whether the given integer is odd integer or not? If any integer which is divisible by 2, then it is called even integer. If it is not divisible by 2, then it is called odd integers. So, take the integer. If it is divisible by 2, even integer. If it is not divisible by 2, then it is called odd integer. So, here I am assuming that P is true. P is true means n is odd integer. n is odd integer. So, n is odd integer means n is not divisible by 2. So, the general form of representing odd integers is this. n is equal to 2k plus 1. If you take 2k plus 1, that is not divisible by 2. So, if n is odd integer, then it can be written 2k plus 1 for any integer k. So, that is the data. That is the data we have in the hypothesis. Now, we have to prove that q is true. What is q? n square is odd integer. So, what I am doing? I am taking n square n is 2k plus 1. Now, n square. n square is 2k plus 1 whole square. If you expand it, you will be getting 4k square plus 4k plus 1. Here, 2k is divisible by 2, 4k is divisible by 2, but 1 is not divisible by 2. Therefore, n square is not divisible by 2. If n square is not divisible by 2, then n square must be odd integer n square must be odd integer. n square must be odd integer is nothing but q of q is true. So, we assume p is true and we have proved q is true. If p is true and q is true, then p conditional q is true. p conditional q is true. So, this is how we prove the given conditional statement is true with the help of diet proof. It's, it's very simple. First, we assume p is true. With the data, we prove that Q is also true. With both of them, we will be concluding that P conditional Q is true. This is about the diet method. This is about the diet method. This is the other example. This is the proof of it. So, what is this one? If M and N are two integers, odd integers, then M plus N, is, N is also even. In. If M and N are odd integers, then m plus n is even integer, which is nothing but the sum of two odd integers is even integer. You have to prove that this statement is true. So, this is the symbolic form of it. First, I am assuming that p is true. p is true is nothing but m and n are odd integers. That is, m is odd integer and n is odd integer. m can be written like this and n can be written like this. Now, in the analysis, I am taking m plus n. So, I add both of them. 2k1 plus 1 plus 2k2 plus 1, 2k1 plus k2 plus 2. That means this total term is divisible by 2. 2 into k plus 1, 2 is k2 is divisible by 2, 2 is also divisible by 2. Therefore, this total expression is divisible by 2. If that expression is divisible by 2, then it is even integer. So, m plus n is even integer. So, here p is true. And we have proved that Q is also true. With the help of P and Q, we will be concluding that P conditional Q is true. This is the direct method. This is the direct method. Now, we'll see the next method. The next method is indirect proof. 
indirect flow. So here I want to recollect one of the very important formulas which I have explained in the first video lecture. So that point is, this is the conditional statement. For this conditional statement, Q conditional P is converse. Next, negation P conditional negation Q is inverse. Next, negation Q conditional negation P is contrapositive. is contra positive. So, this is conditional statement, this is conditional. So, this conditional statement is logically equivalent to contra positive. That we have seen in the video lecture 1. So, if you have not watched the video lecture 1, I suggest you to watch the video lecture 1. In that, I have clearly explained this. So, conditional and contra positive are logically equivalent. And converse and inverse are logically equivalent. Converse and inverse are logically equivalent. So, this is the conditional. Conditional is logically equivalent to contrapositive. Converse is logically equivalent to <coughs> inverse. Now, we will see what is this method. We know that conditional and contrapositive are logically equivalent to each other. In some situations, it is easier to prove that the contrapositive is true instead of the conditional statement and then we conclude that the conditional statement is true. So, for some problems, if you are asked to prove the conditional statement directly, this is, that, this is somewhat difficult. So, in those cases, instead of proving the conditional statement, first we prove that it is a contrapositive is true, then we conclude that the condition is also true because conditional and contrapositive are logically equivalent to. That means we are not going to prove that the condition statement is true directly. We are proving that indirectly, which means first we are proving contrapositive is true, then we are proving conditional is true because contrapositive and conditional are logically equivalent to true. So that is called indirect proof. As we are proving the given conditional statement indirectly, then it is called indirect proof. In the indirect proof, similar to the direct proof, we will be having three steps. Hypothesis, we assume that negation Q, this is the conditional. This is the conditional and this is the contrapositive. We assume that negation Q is true. Then we will be proving that negation P is true. If negation Q is true and negation P is true, then we will be concluding that negation Q conditional, negation P is true. Now, we will take one example and prove it. So, give the indirect proof of the statement. If Mn is even, in, even integer, then M comma N are even integer. That is the conditional statement. Now, we will take the contrapositive of this. The contrapositive of this is this negation Q conditional P, negation P, negation Q conditional negation P means if M comma N are even integers, then Mn is even integer. So, first I am assuming that negation Q is true. What is negation Q? This is P, is, negation, this is Q, take the negation of it. Q is M comma N are even integers is Q, negation means M comma N are odd integers. So, M comma N are odd integers means m can be written in the form of 2k plus 1, n can be written in the form of 2k2 plus 1 for any integers k1 comma k2. That is the hypothesis. Now, in the analysis, we have to prove that negation p is true. So, negation p is true means you have to prove that mn is odd integer. So, I'm, I am adding both of them. 2k1 plus 1 plus 2k plus 2k2 plus 1, which is divisible by 2, which is Take the multiplication of not addition of mn. If you expand this, then you will be getting 4k1 k2 plus 2k1 plus 2k2 plus 1. When we expand this, you will be getting that first three terms are divisible by 2. 
but the last term is not divisible by 2. Therefore, the total term is not divisible by 2. That is, mn is now odd integer. mn is odd integer means negation p is true. So, p is mn is even integer. So, mn is odd integer means negation of p. So, we assumed negation q is true. Then we proved negation p is true. With the help of this true, we will be concluding that contrapositive is true. As contrapositive is logically equivalent to conditional, we also conclude that the conditional statement is true. So this is the indirect proof. Now I'll see the proof by contradiction. So in the proof by contradiction, actually what we have to do, we have to prove that P conditional Q is true. We have to prove that P conditional Q is true. That is the conditional which we have to be proved true. But what we assume that, we assume that P conditional Q is false. Instead of proving P conditional Q is true, first we assume that P conditional Q is false. So P conditional Q is false means P is true and Q is false. Then in the analysis, with the help of hypothesis, we are going to prove that P is false. With the help of hypothesis, we are going to prove that P is false. Now actually what is P? P is true. But with the help of P is true, we are going to prove that P is false. With the help of loss of logics and all the formulas, we prove that P is false. But we have to get P is true, right? So here, P is false is contradiction to the hypothesis. P is false is contradiction to the hypothesis. So we are coming to the contradiction because of wrong assumption. What is the wrong assumption? P conditional Q is false is the wrong assumption. Then the correct assumption is P conditional Q is a true is the correct assumption. So first we assume P conditional P Q is false. Then we are proving it by contradiction. So when P conditional Q is false, P is true and Q is true. So then with the help of loss of logics, we will be proving that Q is, P is false, which is the contradiction to the hypothesis. We are arriving, arriving to the contradiction because of the wrong assumption. The wrong assumption is P conditional Q is false is the wrong, wrong assumption. Then the correct assumption is P conditional Q is true is the correct assumption. So now I will talk one example. So if M is an even integer, then M plus 7 is an odd integer. So the symbolic form of this is P conditional Q, P is M is even integer, Q is M plus 7 is odd integer. Now, first step hypothesis. We assume that P conditional Q is false. That is, P is true and Q is false. So P is true means M is an even integer. M is an even integer means every even integer can be written in the form of 2K. Every even integer can be written in the form of 2K. M is equal to 2K. Now analysis. Since Q is false, what is Q? M plus 7 is odd integer is false. M plus 7 is odd integer is false means M plus 7 is even integer. M plus 7 is even integer means M plus 7 is equal to 2K. Therefore, M is equal to 2K minus 7. 2K minus 7 is not divisible by 2. 2K minus 7 is not divisible by 2. So 2K minus 7 is not divisible by 2 means M is an odd integer. M is an odd integer is nothing but P is false. But what we have assumed P conditional Q is false, which is nothing but P is true. P is true. But what we are getting? We are getting P is false. So this is the contradiction to the hypothesis. We are getting this P is false because of wrong assumption. Now the correct assumption is P conditional Q is true is the raw correct assumption. P conditional Q is true is nothing but if M is an even, even integer, then M plus 7 is an odd integer. So this is the third method, proof by contradiction. Now these three are the methods which we have for proving the given conditional statement is true. Now I'll see the methods for proving the conditional statement are false. Methods of disproof. Methods of disproof is nothing but 
proving the conditional statement is false. Proving the conditional statement is false is called methods of disproof. So here, this methods of disproof to prove the given conditional statement is false, we have two methods. The first one is disproof by contradiction and second one is disproof by counter examples. So now we'll see these two one by one. The first one, disprove by contradiction. Actually, we have to prove that P conditional Q is false. We have to prove that P conditional Q is false. This is the actual statement what we need to uh, prove. But proof by disproof by contradiction means we assume that P conditional Q is true. If Q, P conditional Q is true means P is true and Q is true. Next, in the analysis, with the help of our hypothesis and loss of logic, we prove that P is true. We prove that P is true. So because of contradiction, then because of this is not P is true, this is false. We prove that P is false. So this is the hypothesis. With the help of hypothesis and loss of logics, we prove that P is false. So this P is false is contradiction to the hypothesis. Contradiction to the hypothesis. We are getting P is false because of the wrong assumption made. What is the wrong assumption? P conditional Q is true is wrong. P conditional Q is true is the wrong assumption. So then what is the correct assumption? P conditional Q is false is correct assumption. So in the disproof by contradiction, the actual statement we are supposed to prove is P conditional Q is false, but we are proving it by using contradiction. We assume that P conditional Q is true, which is nothing but P is true and Q is true. With the help of this hypothesis and the loss of logic, we prove that P is false. We are getting the contradiction to the hypothesis that P of true because of the wrong assumption. And in the conclusion section, we conclude that the uh, assumption is wrong. Then the correct assumption is P conditional Q is false is the correct assumption. That we see with the example. So this is the example. The sum of two odd integers is an odd integer. The symbolic form of this is this. P conditional Q, P, M, N, M comma N are odd integers. Q, M plus 7 is, M plus N is odd integers. Next, hypothesis. We assume that P conditional Q is true. That is P is true and Q is true. So now, P is true means, what is P? M comma N or odd integers. That is M can be written in the form of 2K1 plus 1. N can be written in the form of 2K2 plus 1. That is the hypothesis. Now, we are finding M plus N. If you find M plus N, you will be getting 2K1 plus 1 plus 2K2 plus 1, which is nothing but 2 into K1 plus K2 plus 2. That is divisible by 2. That is M plus N is an even integer. So actually, what is M plus N? M plus N is odd integer. But what we are getting? M plus N is even integer. That is the contradiction to the hypothesis. That is the contradiction to the hypothesis. We are getting this contradiction, this contradiction because of the wrong assumption. What is the wrong assumption? P conditional Q is false is wrong assumption. Because of that wrong assumption, we are getting the contradiction here. The, in the con conclusion section, we are concluding that the assumption which we have made is wrong, which is nothing but P conditional Q is false is true. The given statement is false. This is the <coughs> first method of disproof. The second method of disproof. So disprove by counter example. Disprove the statement. This is the other example. You please go through this. It's a simple one. The next method is disprove by the counter example. So in the disprove by the counter example, you are going to disprove the statement with some example that we see with this. This is a very simple one. So look at this. Disprove the statement. 
the statement is the product of any two odd integers is perfect square the product of any two odd integers is perfect square so you have to disprove it actually the product of any two integers is not perfect square so that is a false statement you have to prove it with the, by taking some example so i am taking m is equal to 7 and n is equal to 7 m comma n are two odd integers if you multiply them then you will be getting 21 21 is not a perfect square 21 is not a perfect square so for this example this is one counter example for this statement this is one counter example. even you can take some other counter example m is equal to 5 comma n is equal to 9 so mn the product of these two numbers mn is equal to 45 45 is not a perfect square this is also one counter example so you can take any counter example to prove this statement is false so the example which is serving for proving this statement is false is the counter example we'll see one more example for all integers n n square is equal to n that is one statement so you have to prove it as false if you take n is equal to 3, n square is equal to n. If you take n is equal to 3, n square is equal to 9. Is n square is equal to n? No. n value is 3, n square value is 9. That is, n square is not equal to n. So that is one counter example. Similarly, you can take n is equal to 7. So n square is 49. Is 7 equal to 49? No, 7 is not equal to 49. That means n square is not equal to n. n square is not equal to n. So here they are saying for all integers, for all integers n, we have n square is equal to n. So for all integers n, n square equal to n is not true. Only for some integers, n square is equal to n. What are those some integers? n is equal to 0, 1. If we take n equal to 0, 1, then, then n square is equal to n. So this is the universal quantified statement. This universal quantified statement is false because n is equal to 3 is not satisfying that condition. Suppose in place of universal quantifier, if you take the existential quantifier like this. So I am removing this. For some indices, for some integers, we have n square is equal to n. Yes, this statement is true because there are some integers n is equal to 0, 1 such that n square is equal to n. n square is equal to n. So these are the two methods which we have to disprove the given statement. So this is all about today's session. In today's session, I explained about the statement, open statement quantified statements and then I explained about the quantifiers and different types of quantifiers. Then I explained about implication, argument, valid argument, next methods of proof, methods of disproof. So these are all the topics which we have in this first order logic or quantification logic or predicative logic. So this, this is the session. In the first three sessions I have covered the first unit. So as I told you, the first unit will be having two chapters. One is statements and the second one is open statements. So the first one is mathematical logic one and second one is mathematical logic two. These are all the topics which are there in the mathematical logic two. So this is about today's sessions. Thanks for watching today's live session.